been gone for some time. Because it's summer and because I knew the next video would be about Daedalus. I was, have always been, and am still very conflicted about Daedalus. Part of me, the curious creative side of me, can't help but admire the architect, the inventor, the artist, the scientist and engineer. An instinctual side of me swoons at his intelligence, falls into the trap that is his cleverness, romanticizes his actions, forgets his flaws and wishes to blame his tragedy on circumstances. The side of me that believes that actions should have consequences, that truths come at a cost, that genius does not grant you moral absolution, admits he was also a man guilty of pettiness and pridefulness, culpable of short-sightedness and sometimes simply lacking in morals. I'm no expert, nor a classicist. I haven't studied the ancient texts, the different interpretations of the stories, what they mean or were meant to mean. My relation to Daedalus has always been conflicted, fluid, and personal. He is an allegorical barometer for my own actions and thoughts. Maybe part of me wishes to identify with him because I admire so many of his qualities, but fear I could share his shortcomings. If you cannot tell already, this video has been long in coming because it might be the most personal yet. As I write this narration down, I still question the character and what his story means to me. Thinking deeply about Daedalus has me balanced on a razor's edge where either side of the fall can cut me deep. Between my desire for aesthetic creation and scientific curiosity and my concern for ethical values and universal balance. In ancient stories and myths, to say that an artifact was a creation of Daedalus was to give it its patent of nobility. It was to elevate that object to legendary ingenuity and skill, second only to the creation of Ephaestus. In fact, some traditions claim Daedalus is a descendant of Erichthonius, an ancient king of Athens, said to be the son of Athena, the goddess of wisdom, craft, and war, and Hephaestus, the god of many things, amongst them blacksmiths, artisans, and sculpture. Athenian-born, or so the Athenians later claimed, he was credited for all great feats of creation in archaic stories, like the legendary automatons. Automatons were metal sculptures made to resemble animals and men, the most advanced of which were capable of flight, talking, and even feeling. These were attributed to both Ephaestus and Daedalus. But what of the man? Daedalus was not only intelligent, he was also very clever. More than just talented, he was creative, the archetypical inventor. In fact, Daedalus's name derives from the verb Daedalo, which in ancient Greek means to work cunningly. And for all his many talents, Daedalus' misfortune and subsequent exile were a direct result of his pride and insecurity. Daedalus had an apprentice, his nephew either called Perdix or Talus. Like his uncle, Perdix was a gifted craftsman. After a walk on the seashore, he came across a fish's jawbone which inspired him to create the saw. This invention gave him renown and eventually, Daedalus feared that the student would surpass the master. Overcome with envy, the uncle pushed the nephew off a high cliff. Athena, who admired ingenuity and was fond of Perdix, saved him by turning him into a partridge. 
In fact, a partridge is called a perdrix in French. Two very similar words, don't you think? Daedalus' crime was found out and, as punishment, he was exiled from Athens, which is how he ended up in Crete and became King Minos' personal architect. Daedalus was instrumental in the Minoan-inspired saga of Theseus and the Minotaur. When the king of Crete's wife, Queen Pasiphae, was cursed by Poseidon with lust for a white bull, she turned to Daedalus for a solution. Daedalus built her a hollowed cow. Hidden inside, Queen Pasiphae mated with the bovine creature, and as a result, gave birth to the Minotaur, a creature half man and half bull. To hide his wife's shame, King Minos also turned to the Athenian and had him build a prison of sorts for the monster, which is how the labyrinth came to be. A true maze, it was said that even Daedalus had difficulty finding his way out. When Theseus volunteered to enter the labyrinth as one of the Athenian sacrifices, Ariadne, enamored with the hero, asked Daedalus for help. He is the one who suggested she give Theseus the ball of twine so he could find his way out of the maze. For his treachery and his complicity, Minos punished him and imprisoned Daedalus and his son Icarus at the top of a tower. Unable to flee by land or by sea that were under the control of the king, Daedalus constructed wings with feathers held together by wax and strung them to their bodies with rope. In the myth of Icarus, Daedalus told his son to keep away from gliding too close to the sea for fear that the feathers would get wet and heavy and that they would crush into the water. He also warned him to keep away from flying too close to the sun for fear that the heat would melt the wax holding the feathers together. However, Icarus, who enjoyed taking flight, disregarded his father's instructions and shouted warnings and soared and soared higher and closer to the sun. Eventually, as his father predicted, the wings became undone and Icarus fell to his death, leaving Daedalus distraught. In another video, we will see how Icarus is often cited as an artistic hero to be emulated during the Romantic period, and how his story is also considered a lesson against overambition. But let's go back to Daedalus. Alone and without a home, he made his way to Sicily, to the kingdom of Cocalus. But Minos would not give up and went from city to city trying to lure the cutting men out. He knew Daedalus could not resist flaunting his cleverness and sent word to all kingdoms and their subjects that anyone who could solve the riddle of how to thread a conch shell with a string would be richly rewarded. King Cocalus, who by then knew of his guest's ingenuity, posed a problem to him. Daedalus, in a scenario reminiscent of Ariadne's thread and Theseus' adventure in the labyrinth, tied a string to an ant that he enticed with honey he placed at the other end of the spiraling seashell. When the strong shell was given to Minos, the king of Crete immediately knew he had found Daedalus and demanded that the fugitive be handed back to him. Cocalus was able to convince the king to spend the night and take a bath before he left with his captive. Tricked, the Minuan king was killed by Cocalus's daughters, scalded to death in boiling water. Daedalus, on the other hand, is said to have lived to a ripe old age. Now, there is no doubt that Daedalus was clever, inventive, inspiring even. He was also the inventor of artifacts of dubious morality that had lasting negative effects. The wooden cow, the labyrinth, the wings. Daedalus personifies what 
can happen when science and invention are left unrestrained with complete disregard for ethical consequences. The fact that technological breakthrough is possible begs the question of what impact it will have on people's lives and how to balance innovation with safety. On the last metaphysical plane, Daedalus is also to me a personal lesson on the admiration of heroes and genius. True, he had great qualities and his inventions were impressive, but he was also a prideful man who murdered his own nephew. I can admire his accomplishments, but cannot admire the man. Just like I can love Voyage au bout de la nuit, Journey to the End of the Night by Louis Ferdinand Céline, and still criticize the author for having been a French collaborator during the Second World War. All of this begs the question as to whether admiring the resulting work is in a way an apology for the creator and whether the artwork can ever be entirely divorced from the artist. Like I said from the beginning, Daedalus awakens in me contradicting feelings and questions and instead of giving you any final thoughts, I am leaving you with my questions of balancing aesthetics and ethics. Now, on a musical note, if I could have done so, I would have used an ending, a beginning, by Dustin O'Halloran. You should give it a listen. I chose instead to go with another piece that brings out many subtle, conflicting emotions. Coincidentally enough, I fell in several pieces by Eric Satie called Gnosienne. The term Gnosis seemed familiar, so I looked up what the title could mean. And though some think it may be in relation to the Gnostic religious tradition, some argue it may be derived from the Cretan term Gnosos, which would link Gnosien to the myth of Theseus, Ariadne, and the Minotaur. I could not have planned it better myself. A very happy coincidence indeed. So I leave you with Gnosien by Eric Satie. As always, if you enjoy these stories and would like to have more of them, please like, comment, and subscribe. Thank you for your viewership. Ciao!